On our wedding anniversary, I had booked a table at Eternity, the most famous Western restaurant in City C, a month in advance. The melodious sound of the violin echoed in the restaurant. I wore a white dress and waited for Eddie Carter by the candlelight. It started to drizzle outside. It was already five past six in the afternoon. Eddie was late, but I was used to it. The waiter asked if he should start serving the dishes. I leaned back in my chair and called Eddie Carter. No answer. At 6.27, Eddie finally arrived, wrapped in a black trench coat soaked with rain. Apologetically late. There was an urgent matter at the office, we had a meeting, he explained apologetically. He took off his rain-drenched coat, sat down and looked at me, all dressed up, and suddenly remembered something. I forgot to bring your gift, sorry, I'll make it up to you tomorrow. It's okay. I placed the gift I had prepared for him on the table. Sapphire cufflinks. I thought they would go well with your white shirt. He accepted the gift. As always, praised my thoughtfulness and taste. And placed it on his side. The waiter began to serve the dishes we had ordered. Each dish was his favorite. During our years living abroad together, we had long since learned each other's preferences. We had only taken a couple of bites. When Eddie's phone rang, the name on the screen was particularly glaring, Jen. A woman's name, a nickname, indicates their intimacy. This name had appeared frequently on his phone over the past three months. I was already aware of her existence. But she called on our wedding anniversary, which seemed like she was trying to win my husband's favor. Eddie had always been a person with clear boundaries. I thought he could handle all of this. But I forgot. An 18-year-old female student has an inexplicable attraction to a successful man in his 30s. Sorry, I forgot to mute it. He sought my permission and answered the call. The restaurant was very quiet, and every word from the other end of the line fell into my ears without missing a beat. Mr. Carter, where, where are you right now? It's thundering and I'm so scared. I'm having dinner with my wife. He said, his tone calm yet detached. On the other end was a delicate female voice with a sobbing tone. I'm so scared, the thunder. Reminds me of that incident. Can you come and keep me company, even just for a little while? Every word she said was like a stone thrown into a lake. Rippling through my ears. I clenched my palm, trying hard to maintain a smile. I said I'm with my wife. He patiently explained again. By now, Eddie's tone carried a hint of warning. The person on the other end realized she had upset him and stopped. I'm sorry Mr. Carter, I really didn't mean to disturb you. I'm really sorry. She hung up crying. I thought that would be the end of it. But moments later, Eddie suddenly put down his knife and fork. Claudia, I think I have something to take care of. His eyes were intense. I could see his anxiety. I knew what he needed to handle. Something more important than our fifth anniversary. Go ahead. The moment he stood up, thunder rumbled in the sky, loud and rolling as if the sky was about to collapse. The uneasy candlelight reflected on the blue cufflinks he had left on the table. I raised my hand and threw the pair of cufflinks into the trash can. Had he forgotten? I was also afraid of thunderstorms. Ding! This novel reminds you to click the subscribe button in the bottom right corner to read the complete novel. I stood at the entrance of the restaurant, the drizzle outside blowing against me, making my limbs feel a bit stiff. Maybe it was because of my mood, my stomach ached intermittently. I thought it would pass after a while, as usual. But this time the pain came at me like a wild beast. My vision went dark, and I have no recollection of what happened next. When I woke up again, I was in the hospital. There was a man standing in the sunlight by my bed. The golden sunlight outlined the edges of his silver-gray suit. I squinted my eyes, reached out to him, and habitually called, Honey. He was taken aback, but still held my hand. The touch of this hand felt different from Eddie's. Claudia, are you feeling better? His face came closer, and I finally saw clearly. It was my childhood friend, Vincent. I quickly let go of his hand. 
I had forgotten, Eddie never wore gray suits. Vincent said he and his friends were dining at Eternity and happened to see me faint at the restaurant entrance, so he brought me to the hospital. On the way, he called my husband several times, but the phone was off. Claudia, is there something wrong between you two? He asked with certainty. No. You've never been able to lie to me. He's seeing someone else, isn't he? I smiled, avoiding the topic, just tell me what's wrong with me. Vincent looked at me without speaking, his eyes slowly reddening. The doctor said I had advanced gastric cancer. Not just any gastric cancer, but signet ring cell carcinoma, the devil among gastric cancers. The tissues in my stomach would slowly lose elasticity, eventually turning leathery, an irreversible process. The days I have left could probably be counted on my fingers. In a voice almost pleading, Vincent said, Claudia, you should divorce him. You're not happy with him. What's more, with little time left, I shouldn't waste it on someone like Eddie Carter. But how should I spend the rest of my life then? Vincent is three years older than me, the same age as my husband. He grew up with me, our parents were business friends. We both studied in England initially, but due to busy schedules, we lost touch over time. Later, I went to the United States for graduate school, where I met Eddie Carter, who was pursuing his PhD. He was young and accomplished, and his calm and confident speech at the International Conference on Interventional Cardiology left me in awe. At that time, I was working as a simultaneous interpreter, listening to his voice in the interpreter booth. His voice, deep and elegant like a violin, left me momentarily dazed. His English was standard and fluent, reflecting his top-notch education. His speech was measured and firm, and I even fantasized if he would use this tone when communicating with his future children. After the conference, I found an excuse to see him. His cool and distant demeanor made me want to get closer. Later, I downloaded all his papers and works, reading them one by one, searching for his lecture information, and using work as an excuse to ask him many professional questions. Eventually, we got together. He was always patient and gentle, like an elder, never losing his temper with anyone. But he would fly across half of the United States every week to visit me. When I got home, the smell of jasmine perfume in the house made me nauseous. I leaned over the sink, vomiting for a long time, but only a few mouthfuls of blood came out. Neither of us used perfume, only that female student did. I threw away all his clothes that had the jasmine scent. He never asked where those clothes went. But the next time he came back, there would be more clothes with a strong perfume smell in the house. I threw them away one by one. Cheap men's shirts, which he would never wear, appeared in the house again and again. The clothes were cheap and rough, yet they were folded neatly. Those clothes always sat in a corner of the closet. Out of sight, but always a thorn in my side. Eddie asked me if I was on my period. He saw bloodstains on the bathroom floor. I bought you some sanitary pads, and there's ginger tea in the thermos. Maybe it was because I hadn't been cared for by him like this in a long time. But thinking that he would also care for that female student in the same way made me even sadder. But he showed concern for me, which meant he still cared about me, right? My stomach started to hurt again. I researched many foreign papers online and consulted with medical experts I had worked with before about my condition. I wasn't ready to die just like this. However, Eddie's words also reminded me that I hadn't had my period for two months. I bought a pregnancy test at the pharmacy, and it turned out I was pregnant. Married for five years without getting pregnant, and now, of all times, I was pregnant. I wondered how long I could live and whether this child could be born. My marriage with Eddie was in shambles, so what was the point of having this child? To let him be a motherless child? To let him call that female student stepmother? I decided to talk to Eddie. He taught at the college from Monday to Thursday mornings and spent the rest of the time seeing patients at the hospital. When I arrived at the school, it was just after class. In the classroom where he most often taught, I saw him with that female student. And the passing students were all discussing Eddie Carter and Jenny. Wow, Professor Carter's girlfriend is so young, she looks like she's only 18. What girlfriend, that's his wife. I heard that Professor Carter has been married for a while. That Jenny always seems to make physical contact with Professor Carter intentionally or unintentionally. Don't you know they're already living together? 
Those students were new freshmen, they didn't know me and walked right past me. Their harsh words left my mind in a whirl. So, they were already living together. I didn't even know. The classroom door was open, the crowd had dispersed, and the brightest spring sunlight shone on the two of them. Eddie was wearing a white shirt with rolled up sleeves, leaning on the lectern, patiently explaining some points to Jenny. And Jenny, standing below the lectern, had eyes full of admiration. Her love was evident. I remembered the time when Eddie and I were in love, it seemed I also approached him by asking questions. I saw my own shadow in Jenny. Who wouldn't understand these little tricks of women? They were so engrossed in their conversation that they didn't notice my presence. Just then, a few students passed by behind me. Hey. Mrs. Carter? What are you doing here? Eddie's graduate students still recognized me. Their voices attracted the attention of others. Eddie obviously heard the students, he paused, then he and Jenny looked at me simultaneously. I fled in panic. In the evening, I still didn't cook and sat in the room in a daze. Eddie could eat whatever he wanted, maybe he had to work overtime at the hospital, or perhaps he was staying with that female student. Whatever. The sound of the front door opening and then closing. It seemed like there was another person's footsteps in the house. I was stunned and heard Eddie knock on my room door. Can I come in, Claudia? When the door opened, I smelled that disgusting perfume. Behind him was a girl in a white dress. Claudia, I have something to tell you. I looked at the timid eyes behind him and instantly got angry. Eddie Carter, tell her to leave before you talk to me. Who allowed him to bring outsiders in? He wasn't angry. Instead, he calmly watched me lose my temper while the female student behind him hid, looking all I'm so wronged. Claudia, calm down first. He closed the door. Then he led the female student into his room. When I opened the door, he was sitting in the living room. And he let that female student sleep in his room? Claudia, calm down first and listen to me, okay? Eddie Carter, first of all, this is our home. Don't bring random people here. Claudia, disrespecting her is disrespecting me. I laughed angrily at his words. Have you ever respected me? You bring your mistress home and want me to respect her? Are you planning to take a concubine and have me serve her? Eddie's eyes seemed to see through all my emotions. He looked at me. After I finished venting, he said, Jenny's home was flooded recently and she has nowhere to go, so she can only stay here temporarily. She'll move out once she finds a suitable place. She's just a poor student I'm sponsoring, not the kind of relationship you think. Jenny hid in the room, afraid to come out, just listening to us talk. I threw a black card in Eddie's face. No place to stay? I'll pay for her rent, okay? I have money. Let her take the card and get out. The sharp edge of the card left a cut on Eddie's face. He looked down at the card. Claudia, you know her situation. Her family is very poor, she was sold to a remote area, and she escaped with her life. But she's very diligent and got into college through her own efforts. I wasn't the one who sold her to the remote area, so stop playing miserable in front of me. He picked up the black card, rubbed the edge, and tentatively said to me. She said she wanted to study with me in the future, and the graduate exams are coming up this year. I was shocked when I heard this. Eddie Carter, are you crazy? Why does she need to be your graduate student? She'd be better off as your mistress. If you have such a saintly heart, donate more money to welfare homes, see more patients, don't waste it on a nobody. Eddie didn't get angry. He poured a glass of ice water, trying to cool my temper. Claudia, you and I live in luxury, we can get anything we want. But many people are stuck in dark places, longing for the stars. She's more diligent than many of my students, and I want to give her a chance. Diligent? Diligent in climbing into your bed? I was furious and threw the ice water along with the glass at Eddie's face. Shameless. Your students are screened for millions in the country, their efforts compared to a nobody school student? You're telling me she's more diligent? How many books has she read? Graduate student? She deserves it? Eddie slowly wiped the water and blood off his face with a tissue. Claudia, don't use your strengths to compare to others' weaknesses. 
He's always like this, calm in tone, but always able to make people jump with anger. The more indifferent he was, the more he seemed not to care. If you dare to take her as your graduate student, I'll report you. Do as you please. It seemed he really believed Jenny had the ability to be his student. Eddie Carter, I'll say it one last time, you're not allowed to take her as your student, understand? He didn't speak. I got up and took a suitcase. He never stopped me from beginning to end, letting me make a scene. While I was packing, Jenny finally came out of the room, holding a towel to Eddie's face to wipe his wound, saying with concern, Mr. Carter, you've helped me enough. During my time in the United States, Eddie didn't come to see me even once. He treated it as if it was just an ordinary business trip. Instead, it was Vincent, the economics big shot, who often came here for meetings and visited me in the hospital every time. The cell culture failed, I shrugged helplessly, I don't want chemotherapy. Anyway, I'm dying soon, so I want to choose how I die. Vincent's eyes were always red whenever he visited me. I didn't let him tell Eddie. Because I planned to divorce Eddie Carter. I didn't want to be entangled with him before I died. He recruited that female student as his graduate student. Eddie was determined to be a great philanthropist. Not long ago, I received a text message from a stranger on my phone. There was only one picture in the message. A pregnancy report of that female student named Jenny. And it was twins. Congratulations, Eddie Carter has twins. He'd probably laugh himself awake in his dreams. I'm going to divorce him otherwise, after I die, all the inheritance will be his, and that would be too good for him. I joked. In reality, neither of our families lacked money. Eddie's family was in politics, while mine was in business. If I liked a house, I would buy it directly without any hesitation. After I returned to the country, I temporarily stayed in a house under Vincent's name without telling Eddie I was back. He didn't seem to have time to care anyway. When I sent the divorce agreement to Eddie, he received the courier's notification and only then did he know I had returned. I went to the hospital to schedule an abortion. Because the hospital required the husband to accompany, I spent a lot of money to hire a responsible and dramatic male student online to act as my husband. $5,000 a day, just to act as my husband. He promised to act convincingly and keep his mouth shut. On the morning of the abortion, I ran into a colleague from Eddie's department. I was worried he might inform Eddie, but I was overthinking it. At that time, Eddie had just finished a night shift and had an impromptu surgery to perform. He thought I was just throwing a tantrum or going to the hospital for a usual checkup. Let her be, he said. When his surgery ended at noon, he received an urgent express delivery from the courier. When he opened it, it was a divorce agreement. Eddie was stunned. He thought he had stayed up too long and his eyes were playing tricks on him. But there was my signature clearly on the agreement. The delivery fee is $26, would you like to pay by scan or cash? The delivery man's words pulled him back to reality. Just then, he saw a colleague walking by and stopped him. You said you saw Claudia at the hospital, she came for a checkup? Which department? I didn't ask too many details. Aren't you living together? I saw she seemed to be with a man. Eddie panicked and called the hospital front desk to check my information. Dr. Carter, we found that she came in the morning for a surgery. What surgery? An abortion. At that moment, Eddie's mind went blank, as if it had exploded. He pushed through the crowd, stumbling towards the gynecology operating room. The delivery man chased after him, shouting, Mr. Carter, $26 for the delivery fee. He found the head of the gynecology department and asked where Claudia Klum was. The head of gynecology knew him but didn't know me. They hurriedly scrambled to check my name. At this moment, the door of the operating room opened. He saw me being wheeled out and froze completely. Claudia Klum. He rushed over, grabbing my shoulders, his eyes red and his expression out of control. Dr. Carter, you are. I'm her husband. Who else could I be? It was the first time Eddie had lost his composure like that, he had never gotten angry at anyone, let alone a colleague. Ah. But. They looked at a young man standing to the side. This lady said this is her boyfriend. Miss Clum said it herself. 
boyfriend? Eddie looked at the young man beside him. He grabbed the man's collar and punched him. Where do you get the nerve to pretend to be my wife's boyfriend? The young man was dumbfounded, only now understanding what was going on. Eddie, like a madman, demanded answers from the gynecology department head. She said it and you believed her? You just aborted my child like that? No one dared to speak. After all, who knew someone would pretend to be a family member? After all, the patient and the family had both confirmed it. Moreover, if you and your wife are fighting, why drag others into it? Dr. Carter, do you want to see the fetus? Someone brought out a tray from the operating room, covered with a blue medical cloth, with a bloody mass underneath. Get out! Eddie, agitated, knocked over the tray. I was placed in a single ward. Claudia, why did you do this to me? That was your child too. If I did something wrong, we can fix it. If you're unhappy with me, you can say it. Why hurt yourself? He knelt by the bed, holding my hand, his voice trembling. This incident of medical disturbance spread throughout the hospital. The exemplary Dr. Carter was getting a divorce. It was said that his wife had secretly found a male college student and aborted Dr. Carter's child. Later, the rumors became more outrageous, saying I liked that male student and the child I was carrying was actually the male student's. They even said it was Eddie Carter who asked for a divorce. When I woke up, there was no one by the bed. I didn't know how long I had slept, only that I felt utterly exhausted and wanted to keep sleeping forever, never to wake up. In my dream, I was already dead, and Eddie was kissing that female student at my grave. No one cared whether I lived or died. I got out of bed, but due to a lack of strength, I fell to the ground, pulling out the needle in my arm. Blood spilled everywhere. In my daze, a strong hand pressed down on the bleeding point on my arm. Claudia Clum, if you're tired of living, no one will stop you, but don't die in front of me. Eddie's face was dark as he dragged me up from the floor. I'm sorry, then please avoid me when I die. He took a cotton swab and skillfully wiped away the blood on my hand, then reinserted the needle. Why are you doing this? What do you mean? The divorce? Or the abortion? Both. Eddie, I'm tired of living with you. We've known each other for seven years. You're about to turn 32 this year, a prime age for achieving great things. And I'm about to turn 30, my life still holds many possibilities. I don't like children either. I want to be free, and I believe you do too. Eddie looked at me for a long time, then slowly closed his eyes and took a deep breath. But you should have discussed it with me. Discuss what? Did you discuss it with me when you brought your mistress home? I told you, we're not in the kind of relationship you think we are. Eddie, did she ever pay back the $5,000 she borrowed from you the first time? Did she not pay it back, or did you not want it? Eddie thought that $5,000 was nothing, not even a tenth of what he earned from a single lecture. But this was how Jenny gradually infiltrated Eddie's life, little by little. You've interacted with so many people, you're not stupid, you know Jenny likes you. You can see through all her little tricks. But you never rejected her, you softened time and time again, why? Eddie Carter, admit it, you've already cheated, emotionally. You feel more than just pity for her. He remained calm, not angry. Is there more? Aren't these reasons enough? Sign the divorce papers. I'll give you both freedom. I want my own freedom too. I will cut ties with Jenny, just give me some time. But I don't have much time left. Tomorrow, we'll get a divorce. I have a surgery to perform tomorrow. You're so busy, Dr. Carter. But do you think I have time to waste on you? Claudia, I never intended to divorce you. Just as he was speaking, Eddie's phone rang. There was no need to guess who was calling. He hung up the phone and looked at me. I'll make it clear to her. I'll transfer her to another mentor. There was hope in his eyes. But I had long lost any hope for him. Even if he expelled her, it had nothing to do with me anymore. Because I no longer loved Eddie Carter. During my hospital stay, Eddie came to visit me every day. Each time, he would prepare the healthiest meals as per the doctor's instructions and bring them to me. 
His phone would always ring at the most inconvenient times, but he never answered it. I didn't want to see him acting in front of me. I ran away. Eddie couldn't find any trace of me. But Jenny also disappeared at the same time. Jenny's new mentor accepted her under great pressure but found her grades to be terrible. Moreover, Jenny was very disrespectful towards her new mentor, quarreling with her several times and then calling Eddie pitifully. Eddie didn't answer, so she shamelessly went to his classroom, sitting in the front row and taking notes. The classmates were annoyed by Jenny's unannounced entrance but didn't point it out. Everyone knew about the relationship between Eddie and Jenny, and no one wanted to offend them. Later, Jenny's belly grew bigger and bigger. Then she disappeared. Rumors spread that she was pregnant with Eddie's child, and I, the legitimate wife, had hidden her away. When I heard this news, I was sleeping soundly at Vincent's house. Eddie called me using someone else's phone. His first question was, is Jenny with you? Vincent took the phone from my hand with a smile and started cursing. Your Jenny is out drinking with someone, stop bothering us. Hey, talking to this kind of person is such a buzzkill. Yeah, let's not bother with him. Vincent and I deliberately tried to anger Eddie. He didn't speak for a long time, but I knew this was just his silence before the storm. Claudia, come home. I hung up the phone, not wanting to get entangled with him. Since Eddie didn't want to sign the divorce papers, I would continue to disgust him until he couldn't take it anymore. Anyway, I'm dying, so he shouldn't have a good life either. Eddie never expected me to show up at his mother's birthday party. The outside world was buzzing about my marital problems with Eddie, but I dressed up nicely to celebrate his mother's birthday. Eddie was very surprised to see me, and there was even a hint of joy on his face. Claudia. He thought I had changed my mind. During dinner, Mrs. Carter pulled me to sit beside her, with Eddie sitting to my left. She held my hand the entire time, acting very affectionately. Claudia, I'm so happy you came to celebrate my birthday. Why have you lost so much weight lately? Your complexion doesn't look good either. Eddie, are you not taking good care of your wife? Eddie took my hand and guiltily said he would make Claudia's favorite dishes when we got home. At that moment, someone started probing why Eddie and I had been married for so many years without having children, urging us to start a family. When this topic came up, Eddie became very tense, gripping my hand tightly, and I could feel his palm sweating. I don't need to have his children, I pulled my hand away, Eddie already has kids outside, and they're twins. Everyone looked at me in shock. I didn't look at Eddie's expression and continued. It's almost the due date. Eddie Carter, aren't you going to share the joy of becoming a father with everyone? Claudia, you've had too much to drink. Eddie pulled me over, his arm constraining my body with a warning tone. Let go of me, Eddie Carter. Didn't you say that if I came to your mom's birthday, you'd agree to sign the divorce papers? I'm here now, so when will you sign? His father was already furious, demanding that we take our argument to another room. I'm not leaving. If he doesn't sign the divorce papers, I'm not leaving. I grabbed the dining table, ready to make a big scene. Eddie looked at me coldly, finally calling his assistant to bring the divorce papers. In front of all the guests, I made Eddie lose face completely. He picked up the black pen and looked at me, Claudia, why are you doing this? If you had signed earlier, this wouldn't have happened. A surge of blood rose in my chest, but I forced a fake smile and held it back. Eddie's slender fingers flipped through each page of the divorce agreement. You don't want any of the property? Yes. He gave me a deep look, then pressed the black pen and signed his elegant name on the agreement. I had watched him write and read countless times at the desk. The way he worked so seriously was truly attractive. But that was all in the past. This was the last time. Mr. Carter snatched the divorce agreement, glanced at it to ensure there was nothing unfavorable to his son, and then threw it back to me. I happily took the divorce agreement and ran out of the Carter house. In my haste, I twisted my ankle. I took off my high heels and threw them far away, accidentally breaking one of the Carter House's windows. Shrew. Let her leave quickly. But as soon as I drove away, Eddie chased after me in his car. In the middle of nowhere, he stopped my car in the middle of the road. Damn, is he here to snatch the divorce agreement? Claudia, what exactly do you want? 
He opened my car door and looked down at me. Have you had enough drama? Had your fun? Can you come home with me now? Eddie took the divorce agreement from my hand. I went to fight for it, and the divorce agreement was torn in half. At that moment, I was stunned. Eddie was also taken aback. But before he could react, I suddenly tore the remaining half into pieces and scattered them. Eddie Carter, are you happy now? I gave him a hard push. Unable to hold back the grievances in my heart any longer, tears fell uncontrollably. Probably because he hadn't seen me cry in a long time, Eddie panicked too. Claudia, I'm sorry, he tried to hold my hand, but I pushed him away. I don't want to separate from you. Get lost. Eddie Carter, go on your honeymoon with your mistress. I'll be with the person I like. Why should I comply just because you want to come back? I've already broken up with Jenny. I have nothing to do with her. The child isn't mine. The child isn't yours, is it mine? I smiled bitterly. Right, you reminded me, our child is already gone. Eddie's expression was restrained, Claudia, there will be more. No, there won't be any more. At this moment, Eddie's phone rang. He hung up. A text message appeared on his phone. He glanced at the message, and his previously pained expression turned into tension. He called back, but the call went unanswered. Come back with me. He grabbed my hand and forcibly pulled me into the car. All the way, he kept calling that number. It showed as powered off. He called a friend, help me check on Jenny's situation. I've sent you the address. Then Eddie dragged me to a hotel. The place was already surrounded by police. A woman had jumped from the building and committed suicide. It was Jenny. I knew that before I died, Jenny still went around against me. Jenny left a handwritten letter. Before the police arrived, it was already taken by Eddie's friend. After Eddie read it, he burned it. He asked me why. Why did I push Jenny to her death? Clearly, he had no relationship with Jenny. The child in Jenny's belly wasn't his either. She couldn't get Eddie, so she wanted to destroy me. After all, she was a rotten person herself. I didn't allow Eddie to collect her body, nor did I allow him to handle her funeral affairs. She was a malicious woman. Eddie was truly angry, he said I was the malicious one. He said no matter how many mistakes, they should all pass after death. I looked at Eddie in disbelief. Eddie Carter, you said you didn't love her. If you didn't love her, you let her slander your wife time and time again. You believed her. You took it seriously. You came to question me. If her death can make you trust her, then what about my death? If I die too, will you trust her or me? The anger surged in his eyes, probably because his mistress was already dead, and I was still making sarcastic remarks, he was really furious. Claudia Klum, are you threatening me with death? I'm not threatening you, I'm already dying anyway. He locked me in the room, saying that when I figured things out and wanted to communicate with him properly, I could come find him. That night, my condition took a sudden turn for the worse. I fell unconscious in the room. Eddie initially thought I was just trying to scare him, but when he came over to me, he found my breathing weak. He froze at that moment, his blood turning to ice. He called 911 and rushed me to the hospital, holding me in his arms. It was too late. I was already tired of the days spent with him. Death, to me, was just another form of rebirth. The doctors ran various tests and informed him that I was in the final stages of cancer, with organ failure, and could pass away at any moment. He broke down. No way. Why? These were the two phrases he repeated the most. Why, why didn't you tell me? He tightly held my hand, begging me to get better. Claudia, don't you have so much more to say to me? We still have misunderstandings to clear up. You still need to sign the divorce papers with me, you can't die. He knelt by my bed, refusing to eat or drink, but he never heard any response from me. Sweetie, when you get better, I'll take you home, take you to America. We'll go back to the way things were, okay? He kissed my forehead again and again, but I couldn't give him any response. Please, say something to me, anything. Even if you hate me. I shouldn't have argued with you, shouldn't have made you angry, 
Claudia. We promised to go to Antarctica to see the penguins together after we retired. He was a cardiac surgeon, but on a stormy night, he could no longer feel my heartbeat. Claudia, if you want to leave me, you don't have to do it this way in the future. According to Article 51 of the Civil Code, the marriage relationship of a person declared dead is dissolved from the date of the death declaration. From that moment on, I no longer had any relationship with Eddie Carter. After I passed away, Eddie, the materialist cardiothoracic surgeon, suddenly resigned from his position and turned to studying metaphysics and mysticism. He began to drink heavily. Every night, he would drink alone in our former home, getting drunk in the hope that he could see me this way. He burned all the jasmine-scented shirts in the house. He tried hard to find the clothes I had bought for him only to discover that there were very few left. Most of my belongings had been cleared out before I went to the United States. He later learned that my trip to the United States was not for training. It was for treatment. At that time, he never called me, instead helping a female student find and settle into an apartment. After my death, Eddie's mental state was never good. He would lie on my bed every day, holding my pillow and my clothes, unwilling to wake up. Why don't you come to me in my dreams? Do you still resent me? Why wasn't it me who died? Why couldn't I have died in your place? Eddie knelt by the bed, honey, it's raining. This time, can I stay with you? An eccentric old woman asked Eddie if he wanted to see the deceased. It would only cost him ten years of his life. Eddie said, as long as I can see her again. Even if just once. One night, on his way home. Eddie was walking and suddenly felt like someone was following him. But he wasn't scared at all at that moment. He knew who it was. Eddie stood there without turning around. Honey, is that you? The wind howled past, hurting his cheeks, and suddenly it started to snow. But he knew he must be dreaming. It was only the beginning of autumn. Suddenly, a voice called out from behind him. Eddie Carter. His body trembled violently, and tears uncontrollably streamed down his face. Hope we will never meet again in this life. He turned around, trying to grasp something, but only a snowflake fell into his palm.